Good evening. It's a joy to welcome you to another one of our midweek Bible studies. When we last met, we studied in Genesis 28 about Jacob's dream of a stairway to heaven in which God promised to extend to him the covenant blessings he had already established with Abraham and Isaac. Chapter 29, which serves as a background for our focal lesson in chapter 30 this evening, opens with Jacob continuing his journey on toward Paddan Aram and arriving to that region as we read in verse 1. Uh, the opening verses of the chapter describe him observing a well that is in a field before him, covered by a stone with three different flocks of sheep waiting to be watered from it. Uh, Jacob strikes up a conversation with the shepherds of these different flocks, and he inquires of them where they're from and if they know Laban, his uncle. Uh, when they respond that they do know him, Jacob inquires as to how Laban is doing and they answer in verse 6 that he's doing well, and then they call his attention to Rachel, Laban's daughter, who is approaching the well with the flock of sheep uh, that she is tending for her father. At this point, Jacob springs into action, moving the stone from the well, and proceeds to water the sheep that she is herding. And in what has to be one of the shortest courtships in history, we read in the very next verse that Jacob kisses Rachel, lifted his voice, and wept. I really wish that the author had recorded what he what Jacob said as he raised his voice. I, I suspect that maybe it was a shout of joy at having found a beautiful cousin. It's only then that he identifies himself to her as the son of her aunt Rebecca. And I don't know if Laban's family had a background in cross-country racing or not, but we read in verse 12 that Rebecca ran to tell the news to her father. And hearing his daughter's report, Laban likewise sprints to meet Jacob and embraces and kisses him. There's considerable running and kissing in this story. Laban invites Jacob to his home where Jacob fills him in on all these things as we read. I wonder how honest he was and how many details he shared uh, with his uncle about conspiring with Laban's sister, his mom, to cheat Esau out of the blessing of the firstborn. May, maybe all these things didn't include a full-blown confession of his wrongdoing, but perhaps he did reveal that he had fled there to escape the wrath of his younger, or I should say his older, uh, twin brother. Laban describes that Jacob is his own flesh uh, and blood. He declares this and welcomes him to stay with him, which uh, Jacob does for a month. Evidently, Jacob was helping out with the chores because in verse 15, Laban suggests he shouldn't be serving him for nothing, and he asks what wages uh, Jacob would like to receive. Jacob declares in verse 18 that he will gladly serve Laban for seven years for the right to marry his younger daughter, Rachel. Now, we know that there's an older daughter because the writer interject, interjects some details about Leah in verses 16 through 17. The description of her speaks only of her eyes. And the language here is sufficiently obscure in the Hebrew that various English translations differ widely in how they describe Leah's eyes. Many of them, uh, the translations speak of her eyes in a negative fashion, describing them as weak, delicate, tender, ordinary, dull, plain, bleary, with no sparkle or brightness. But other translations take a 180 degree different approach, calling her eyes lovely or attractive. Evidently, the, the Hebrew is sufficiently obscure at this point. Uh, the Message Bible, for example, renders it this way. Leah had nice eyes, but Rachel was stunningly beautiful. Uh, various versions speak very positively, positively of Rachel's lovely figure and her beautiful face or appearance. It's little wonder that Jacob's proposed salary of seven years to work uh, for Laban focus on receiving the younger daughter, Rachel, as his wife. Well, Jacob labors for those seven specified years for the right to marry Rachel, but the deceiver gets schooled by his uncle on this wedding night when Laban substitutes Leah, the older daughter, in place of Rachel after the wedding feast. I wonder, had Jacob had too much wine to drink or was he blindfolded when he took Leah to be his wife? Maybe it was simply too dark in the tent or the room uh, where they are uh, consummating the marriage to tell the difference. It's a bit confusing as to how he could have mistaken the older sister for the younger one, but that's exactly what happened. Well, by the light of day, when morning comes, Jacob has discovered Laban, Laban's deceit and, and he confronts him about it. And Laban goes on to explain that their custom isn't to marry off a younger sister before the firstborn was married. So 
Laban proposes that Jacob work an additional seven years for Rachel's hand in marriage. And I'll have to confess for a long time, I misunderstood this passage, thinking that he had to wait until the completion of those additional seven years for the right to marry Rachel. But the passage indicates in Genesis 29, 30, that Jacob merely had to agree to work for the added seven years for the right to marry Rachel, which he did. But the verse uh, goes on to tell us that Rachel was loved by Jacob more than Leah. Uh, some of the same favoritism that his own parents had displayed, uh, Isaac toward Esau and Rebekah toward uh, him, him uh, came into play in this relationship as well. Well, God intervenes in this situation because Leah is not loved by him, and, and God enables her to bear children uh, for Jacob while Rachel is barren, as we read in verse 31. Leah proceeds to have four sons with Jacob, and she thinks each time that the new baby and, and his arrival will cause Jacob to love her more, but that doesn't seem to have happened. Rachel is observing this whole process, and jealous is, in, in her jealousy, she confronts Jacob in Genesis chapter 30, verse 1, ordering him to give her children or she will die. Now, Jacob, in turn, is rather angry with Rachel's confrontation for demanding something that is above his pay grade and, and out of his control. He replies in verse 2 that he isn't God. He's not the one who has pro prohibited her from uh, being able to conceive a child. Well, she takes matters into her own hands along the line of what Sarai had done earlier with her slave Hagar, and she gives her maid Bilhah to Jacob and tells him to have a child with her. And he does so twice, uh, with the results being the births of Dan and Naphtali. Meanwhile, uh, for a period of time, Leah has not been able to conceive additional children beyond the four sons that she had with Jacob, but she gives her maid Zilpah to Jacob as a wife, resulting in the births of two more sons, Gad and Asher. But later, she is able to conceive, uh, Leah, that is, uh, to conceive two additional sons, Issachar and Zebulun, uh, before she also has a daughter with uh, Jacob named Dinah. At long last, in Genesis 30, verse 22, we read that God remembered Rachel and he gave her a son with Jacob as well. And at his birth, this child is named by her Joseph, meaning God shall add. And she expresses her desire and her hope that God will give her yet another son. That request would later be answered, but at the cost of her own life because Rachel died while giving birth to Benjamin, as we read in Genesis chapter 35, verses 16 through 20. Well, our focal lesson picks up in verse 25 with the statement that after Joseph's birth, Jacob went to Laban and told him that it was time that he returned to his own place, his own country, the, the land of Canaan or the promised land as we know it. Jacob continued in verse 26 and told Laban to give him his wives and his children, this growing clan of, of kids that he has uh, fostered and, and fathered, I should say, by uh, both Leah, by Rachel, and their maidens. And he says, it's time for me to go uh, after these 14 years of having served you. Uh, Laban counters that he's not prepared yet to let Laban return to his home country with his family because he has discerned, and literally the word here is divined or determined by divination, that God has blessed Laban on account of Jacob. This process of divination was a process of foretelling the future or discerning what to do by reading signs and omens. Sometimes diviners analyze the liver or other internal organs of an animal to determine uh, what, uh, what course of action to pursue. This was a practice that was repeatedly condemned in the scriptures because it, it was linked often to the demonic realm. Now, we're not told exactly how Laban divined or determined that Jacob's presence with him was the source of him being blessed by God with abundance, but he's convinced that that's the case. And because of that, Laban confirms, uh, or uh, Laban repeats, I should say, his earlier offer for Jacob to name his wages in verse 28. Uh, uh, name your wages to stay with me longer is basically what he's saying. And Jacob basically, Jacob basically confirms here what Laban has concluded, stating that the evidence of God's blessing of Laban is plain to see. And he references the smaller number of cattle that Laban had before Jacob began serving him, in contrast uh, to the multitude that he now has. And this is found in verses 29 and 30. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jacob concludes verse 30 by saying, it's high time that he begins to provide for his own growing household. 
And Laban responds simply by reiterating his request to know what kind of wages are going to be expected by Jacob if he can be convinced to stay on and keep working for him in order to convince uh, that he can continue to experience God's blessings upon him. Uh, Jacob's answer follows in verses 31 and 32 when he requests that Laban allow him that day to pass among all his flock and remove every speckled or spotted sheep and every black lamb along with every spotted or speckled goat. And these are to be his wages for continuing to work for him. Uh, in doing all this, Jacob is bas basically following in the footsteps of many of his ancestors who were shepherds by trade. Uh, sheep, sheep, of course, symbolized wealth in that day because they were the source of food, of milk, of wool, and of leather. Uh, they would later, of course, become the principal animals used in the Old Testament sacrificial system under the Mosaic Law. And two of the best-known leaders of God's people in the Old Testament were also shepherds by trade. I'm thinking of Moses and David. Jacob goes on to state that his honesty will be observable later when it comes to settling accounts with his, uh, his father-in-law Laban. He says if there are any non-speckled or spotted lambs among the sheep or goats, these were to be considered as having been stolen by him. Now, the norm would be for goats to be dark or brown and for sheep to be white. So Jacob is even designating the less desirable and less likely to occur as his wages. Laban says, okay, that's a, that's a deal in verse 34. But then he acts deceptively once more by removing the striped and spotted male goats and all the speckled and spotted female goats along with the black sheep and gives those to his own son and then distancing himself a three days journey from Jacob. So with the cards kind of stacked against him in this, this arrangement, Jacob devises a plan that involves peeling the bark from different trees, poplar, almond, and plane trees, P-L-A-N-E. Uh, and then he places the wads of these trees by the watering holes where the flocks come to drink and will mate. And Jacob will later explain to his wives as they prepare to leave and return to the land of Canaan that God had spoken to him in a dream about the animals mating and an abundance of speckled and striped and mottled animals being the result. Okay. That account is found in Genesis 31, verses 40 to 12. Well, Genesis 41 of our text in Genesis 30, uh, verse 31, I should say, verse 41, uh, <laughs> verse 41 of Genesis 30 states that Jacob would put these branches or rods or poles, as they're described, in front of the stronger animals of the flock on the days that they were mating, but not when the weaker ones were present. And the result of, we, of all of this we read in the concluding verse of our lesson today was that Jacob became exceedingly prosperous. His flocks became far more numerous and stronger than the animals of his father-in-law Laban. In addition to his flocks of sheep and goats, he also acquired, as we read, female and male slaves or servants and camels and donkeys. Uh, we noted previously that when Abraham had dispatched his servant with 10 camels, uh, loaded with with gifts to travel to Paddan Aram when he was seeking a wife for Isaac. Uh, these pack animals were an important means of transporting goods for, for, for certain. Donkeys, on the other hand, served more to transport people. Uh, horses would be more likely to be used in times of war, but donkeys were considered more peaceful animals and were used uh, to ride by, by the poor in particular. And especially after Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9, when he entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey, the, these animals became uh, associated with peaceful, being peaceful animals. Now, the statement about Jacob's prosperity here certainly raises questions about the role of wealth as a sign of God's blessing. And I want to suggest to you that this is a far more prominent notion in the Old Testament than it is in the New Testament. Jesus sp spoke much more about the blessings of God resting upon the poor and the impoverished and the difficulty about rich people entering into God's kingdom. You remember, obviously, his statement about the difficulty of a camel passing through the eye of a needle as he describes how difficult it is for the rich to enter heaven. Uh, there are a lot of preachers of the false gospel of health and prosperity in our day whose message resonate with a lot of followers who buy into this preaching about God wanting all of his children to be rich and healthy. And that's usually linked, of course, with an appeal to donate generously to their ministries, which makes it possible for them to enjoy multi-million dollar mansions and private jets and, and things along that line. And while God certainly can and no doubt does bless folks with wealth who demonstrate financial uh, 
uh, stewardship, faithful stewardship of the resources God has entrusted to them, we surely shouldn't jump to the conclusion that every wealthy person is being blessed by God, while the poor, on the other hand, are somehow being unfaithful to him. Jesus' consistent teaching serves as a sharp corrective to that kind of thinking. Uh, so as we think about Jacob being prospered by God, uh, it certainly was a, a, a a result of God's grace toward him. We could, we could affirm that and, uh, and certainly uh, underscore that truth, but we shouldn't uh, conclude necessarily that every wealthy person is enjoying uh, the benefits of, of God's blessings upon them. I want to invite you to, to pray with me as we wrap up our study this evening. Gracious Father, we do thank you that we know that you are a God who chooses to bless people uh, financially with wealth and with uh, with riches, with resources. And Father, as you do that, you expect us to be faithful stewards of what you entrust to us. And Lord, we recognize at the same time that there are poverty. <laughs> there is poverty. There are poor people all around us. And you expect us to uh, to do what we can within our means to, to be a blessing to them. Uh, over and over again, your scripture tells us to be mindful of the poor and to, to care for their needs. And so Lord, we pray that you would give us uh, opportunities to do that and give us a discernment to know uh, who to help and how we can within the resources that you have blessed us with. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word together this evening. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you this coming Lord's Day. This Sunday is Hay Day. We'll be wearing name tags to make sure that we know each other as we think about uh, God giving us a new name and the things that we're called by the Lord in Scripture. So I invite you to be with us this coming Sunday. and Look forward to seeing you then. Bye for now.